The second scripture reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 1, just verse, verse 16. So hear now the word of the Lord. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last Monday was a great day to live in Spokane, wasn't it? Do you remember what last Monday was? It's sometimes hard to remember what you were doing a week ago, but I bet you know where you were. Eric and I didn't have a screen at home that would do the Gonzaga game justice, so we headed up to the Garland Theater for a Zags watch party. I'm telling you that was the way to go. We knew it was going to be good when the whole crowd stood for the national anthem and even sang along. We cheered for every player in the opening lineup. We jumped up and screamed at every point made, and we all chanted, defense, defense, whenever North Carolina had the ball. If we had not stepped outside at halftime, we would have completely forgotten we were even in Spokane. I don't normally follow basketball, but Monday was a very special night. To emit that kind of full-on, total body praise together with our community felt natural, like what we were made for in that moment. It made me want to be a full-time Zags fan like many of you are. If I had known how much fun it was going to be to go crazy like that, to be a part of something big and suspenseful, I would have watched every game, not just the last three. <laughs> Outward, unabashed expressions of praise is what we're talking about today. What does it mean to give yourself over to something greater than yourself? To be caught up in someone else's work. The multitudes of disciples who were gathered in Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, didn't seem to have any problem publicly expressing their praise toward Jesus. They spread their cloaks on the colt and then on the road to show deference to Jesus. They chanted, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, over and over. They shouted out praise to God for all the deeds of power, those miracles they had seen. Like Gonzaga fans on Monday night, they were unashamed and all in with their praise. They didn't know how it was going to end, but that was the farthest thing from their minds. They simply put their arms in the air and shouted themselves hoarse. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were not so thrilled. We're not even sure why they were around when this procession was moving through the city. It would have been like someone watching the game on Monday night with their arms crossed or their ears covered. Why not just stay home? At any rate, the Pharisees did not like seeing the multitudes of people shouting and waving and carrying on. And so they finally got Jesus' attention and said, order your disciples to stop. The Pharisees had usually dis expressed disapproval for Jesus himself, wanting him to stop doing what he was doing or saying what he was saying. But in this scene, they wanted the disciples to stop. Something about the disciples' outward demonstrations of praise was deeply troubling to the Pharisees. It could be that they did not want the Romans to hear Jesus being called king and so crack down even harder on the Jews. The Pharisees couldn't risk losing the freedoms they already had. It could be that they were actually concerned about Jesus' safety. They had, wanted, they had warned Jesus earlier that Herod was trying to kill him. But I think a more likely explanation is that they were trying to protect these multitudes of people from being disillusioned. Jesus was heading down a dangerous path 
that could only lead to rejection and death. They could not sit by and watch as this man who claimed to be the Messiah failed miserably in bringing peace to Israel. I think the Pharisees wanted the disciples' praise to stop because deep down, they were ashamed of Jesus. It's not hard to see where they're coming from. How did Jesus expect to have an impact? He was the son of common folks from Nazareth. He had gathered around himself a a group of undereducated laborers as his closest disciples. He wasn't at all careful about his reputation, eating with known sinners. And his bold claims and actions were only getting him into trouble. Even if he were the Messiah, he would do no good if he were dead. The Pharisees were just plain uncomfortable with the idea of a suffering Messiah, of a man with no worldly power or prowess, promising to bring peace to a conflicted people. But maybe we are a bit uncomfortable with that too. The world, after all, is seriously broken. In the midst of war and disease, cycles of abuse and poverty, do you ever find yourself wondering, what real hope does Jesus bring? Overwhelmed by the state of things, we might look to the suffering Christ and feel a bit embarrassed that we don't have more to offer. I mean, dare we say Jesus loves you, to a child who has never felt safe in a family. Or God is faithful to a couple who is unable to conceive. Are we naive to pray prayers of gratitude at our dinner tables while just around the corner of the world, mothers are mourning the death of their children? If you have ever censored your praise of God, because of the darkness of the world. If you have ever stopped yourself from acknowledging God's presence, you have felt the angst of the Pharisees on Palm Sunday. As the days wore on, it wouldn't be the Pharisees alone who were doubtful and ashamed. As Jesus suffered and died on a cross, Peter would be too ashamed to associate with him the rest of Jesus' disciples would flee. They all would wonder for a time where God was in the suffering. And in the darkness, their praise would cease. But did you notice what Jesus said to the Pharisees when they wanted the disciples' praise to stop? If these were silent, he said, even the stones would shout out. And they did. After Jesus' body was laid in the tomb, and everyone thought suffering would have the last word, the disciples found the stone rolled back. It was as if the stone itself proclaimed God's love for this hurting world, a love that could not be held in. The disciples would soon discover that Jesus' suffering and death was nothing to be ashamed of. It was a necessary part of salvation. In the face of a seriously broken world, God could have given up and turned away. Instead, God in Christ plunged into the suffering felt the full weight of it, and then actively claimed victory over sin and death. There is now no suspense over who will win in the end. Jesus is and will be the victor. And so the Apostle Paul said boldly, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. And now we are invited into that unabashed praise. 
trusting in the subversive power of God, we do dare to offer one another the gift of presence in the midst of heartache. We can continue to pray in boldness, knowing that God cares and is at work. We can utter things like God is faithful and Jesus loves you because Jesus has proven these things to be true. In fact, when we give ourselves over to God's community of praise, we have the sense that we were made or remade for these very moments. Now, this is not to say that we will never hold back. At times, we will fail to speak up. We will fail to be present. We will let our doubt get the best of us, and we will shrink in despair. But the gospel will not be thwarted by our paralysis. It will continue to find expression through sacrificial acts of generosity, through the simple faith of children, through the sheer magnificence of creation. The stones will cry out. The trees will clap their hands. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather give myself over to this community of praise than sit in silence. I know I told a story from Guatemala the last time I preached, but I've got another one. There was a group of us that went to Guatemala in February, and just before we left the country, our group heard about a ministry going on near the Guatemala City dump. The dump there is like a mini city. Families have built makeshift homes around the dump from the cast-offs of others, and they find their food and perhaps items to sell in the piles of trash. It is a sickening picture of poverty, of extreme poverty. In 1999, a young graduate student in education named Hanley Denning visited the dump and could not believe what she was seeing. School-aged children would flock to the garbage trucks as they arrived, and they would carry away boxes of wilted lettuce for their family. They would scrounge for just barely used diapers to give to their younger siblings. Hanley could have shaken her head in despair and come back to the States in shocked silence. But she didn't. Unashamed of the gospel and sure of its power, Hanley sold her car and her computer and emptied her savings account. She opened the doors of a new educational center called Safe Passage, Camino Seguro, for children who lived at the dump and for their parents. And she enrolled 46 students that year. Today, the center reaches 550 children and 100 parents giving them the educational tools they need to escape from the dump and from the cycle of poverty. Hanley Denning gave her life as an offering of praise to the Savior of the world. It was what she was made for in that moment. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. How will you give yourself over in praise? Let us pray.